보도록 하겠습니다. 네, 화상으로 저희가 말씀을 나눠보기 전에 어, 소개 동영상을 보고 진행을 하도록 하겠습니다. 네, 영상 부탁드립니다. 방금 말씀드렸던 그 장면입니다. 이 이름이 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 We are in a climate crisis. If we don't get this right, nothing else matters. And Mr. Speaker, this is where we draw the line. Aotearoa New Zealand is a Pacific nation. We are in the top 10 nations for pollution per capita. Our diplomats and our negotiators are seen as amongst the best in the world. We are responsible and we must be responsible. Mr. Speaker, how many world leaders for how many decades have seen and known what is coming but have decided that it is more politically expedient to keep it behind closed doors? My generation and the generations after me do not have that luxury. In the year 2050, I will be 56 years old. Yet, right now, the average age of this 52nd Parliament is 49 years old. Okay, Boomer. Uh, current political institutions have proven themselves incompetent of thinking outside of a short political term. Change is so regularly... <laughs> Kia ora. Uh, I hope that I can be heard at the moment. Can anyone give me a wave from the audience if you can hear me? Okay, brilliant. <laughs> um, hi, my name is uh, Chloe Swarbrick. I am the Green Party MP uh, from Auckland Central, which is the largest city in New Zealand. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but if you know our large, spindly uh, country just below Australia, uh, we're towards the top of the North Island. Uh, today, I just want to start by acknowledging uh, the trauma and devastation that is presently unfolding uh, in Australia, uh, our neighbours in Australia. Uh, I understand that I'm obviously speaking to you uh, in Asia at the moment, and I very much count myself as a member of the Pacific. So uh, what we're seeing right now, uh, the point that I made on social media, I believe only yesterday, um, it's all been <laughs> Uh, is that while there seems to be this bickering, particularly from the political institution and the leaders in Australian Parliament at present, about how you can't necessarily link explicitly which uh, carbon emissions are responsible for certain uh, devastation, you know, when you think about it in terms of the analogy of lung cancer and the smoker, it's exactly the case that you can't pinpoint which cigarette caused the lung cancer. The point is that we have reached a tipping point and moved into a climate crisis. I'm not sure how much of that video uh, that was just played you managed to see. Uh, there is a, a short part of that video which has gone viral um, for, I guess, uh, summarising a bit of frustration that is felt by a number of young activists uh, in the climate change space, uh, that being the slowness of change or the impediments that uh, those who have occupied positions of power for a long time are putting up. Uh, change is often uncomfortable for those who occupy positions of power and those who make profit off of the status quo. So it's important to remember that change is always going to be hard, uh, particularly for those of us who operate outside of those institutions. I'll um, do this talk in kind of two major parts. The first will be giving you a bit of insight and context as to how I, uh, as a 23-year-old on the 23rd of September 2017, came to be elected in New Zealand Parliament as the youngest in 43 years, uh, and also how we then moved on to form government with, obviously, Jacinda Ardern as our Prime Minister. And then I'll move into uh, how we have got some real serious policy gains across the line, hopefully giving you some background and insight into uh, some of the political challenges, which means that we're not going to be able to get everything that we want 
And while perhaps it looks good on paper, uh, particularly internationally when you don't know the granular detail, uh, it's really important that we continue to push the boat out to give licence, particularly to other citizens, other activists and advocates in other countries to push their governments to go further, basically to prove that it is possible to do these things. I'll then try and apply uh, those learnings both in uh, my personal experience as a young politician uh, and what we've managed to achieve as eight Green MPs in Parliament to how uh, we can hopefully move forward in creating some form of collaborative network uh, with younger people but also actually just all progressively minded folks across the world at the moment. Uh, climate change is very much uh, forefront of mind because its tangible impacts are being felt uh, right now here in the Asia Pacific. So, uh, to give you a bit of background for those of you who may not uh, be aware of what the Greens have been up to uh, over the past kind of 20 years, which is around the amount of time that we've been in the New Zealand Parliament. We operate in Aotearoa, New Zealand, Aotearoa being the indigenous name, uh, the Te Reo Māori name for New Zealand. We operate in this country under a Westminster colonial model, so it's very similar to the UK's uh, model of Parliament. Uh, but we don't have a bicameral system, so we don't have an upper and a lower house, we have one house. Uh, meaning that uh, our head of state at present, we operate under a constitutional monarchy, so the Queen is still our Queen, uh, much like in uh, Australia as well and in a number of other uh, colonies. Uh, but that means that we have quite a simple system for New Zealanders, for citizens in this country to get their head around. Essentially, when New Zealanders go to their polling booth, they have two votes to make. One is for the party that they want to represent them, and the other is for the electoral uh, representative that they want. We have 70 electorates across uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand, and different parties put forward candidates for each of those electorates. So those 70 seats are allocated uh, on what is the first-past-the-post system. The other 50 seats are allocated on a list-based system. This was transformational for getting the Green Party and other smaller parties like New Zealand First, who also helped form this most recent government, into Parliament, because the larger parties, National and Labour here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, have the resources to throw at those seats all across the country. So the Greens in 2017, after a very rough election campaign, uh, we got eight MPs elected. I was number seven on our list. And we then went into negotiations to help form the government. We formed a confidence and supply agreement with the Labour Party, which is obviously headed up by, led by Jacinda Ardern. And the Labour Party formulated a coalition agreement with a party called New Zealand First. Uh, New Zealand First's principles and ideals are probably quite obvious in its name. Uh, it does strike a chord that is similar to the likes of what we've seen uh, in America with the kinds of rhetoric like make America great again. However, it's not so extreme, thankfully. Uh, one of their more identifiable ideologies is economic nationalism. But they are quite conservative on a number of fronts. So it's been really interesting as a majority of three different parties in government figuring out how we can come to consensus on moving forward in certain areas. Thankfully, the basis for a lot of those places or commitments where we are moving forward are outlined in what is called the Confidence and Supply Agreement. So the Confidence and Supply Agreement was nailed in stone between Labour and the Greens in order to form this part of the government. The Conference and Supply Agreement has two major key components which are now being renowned or recognised internationally, uh, largely by uh, the kind of rhetoric that Jacinda, for example, our Prime Minister, has put out at uh, the United Nations, uh, but also because of the impacts that it's having in this increasingly climate change world. So the first of those is what is called the Zero Carbon Bill. It's now an act, so it's the Zero Carbon Act, thankfully, because it has passed its third and final reading, and it's also passed Royal Assent. What's really cool and fascinating about the Zero Carbon uh, Bill, the Zero Carbon Act, is that the very idea for it originally came from a number of youth activists in Aotearoa, New Zealand. They're called Generation Zero, and they have been working for approximately five to seven years now across different parties and with different youth 
uh, movements within different political parties from the left to the right of the spectrum trying to get buy-in in each of those political parties for movement on climate change. The genius in what they did is advocating not just simply for a target or for specific ways to get to that target or reduce emissions, because that is a really politically charged area. What they advocated for was a framework to reduce those emissions. So it's really similar here actually to the framework that is in the Climate Change Act 2008 from the UK, the United Kingdom, uh, which passed actually also somewhat unanimously with only a few uh, MPs holding out their votes in the UK in 2008. Uh, I'm on the Environment Select Committee here in New Zealand and was fortunate to sit on the committee as we developed the zero carbon legislation with enormous backing and behind the scenes work on the ground by activists and advocates within this NGO, non-governmental organisation called Generation Zero. And they worked really hard to develop the respect of businesses, uh, interestingly, and also obviously quite controversial because a number of us who are involved in climate action are also uh, typically quite sceptical of large business. Uh, to get the buy-in of farmers, which is hugely important here in New Zealand because 48% of our emissions and our emissions profile come from agriculture. It's very different to other countries. We have uh, nearly 98% renewable energy uh, in New Zealand, So, uh, it, it, because obviously we're an island, so we have the good fortune of generating our power through uh, tide and through uh, wind. But as we developed this legislation, we essentially created a framework where in the legislation, in the law itself, it says that we are going to get to carbon neutrality in this country uh, to stay within 1.5 degrees with a New Zealand's contribution to international emissions, stay within 1.5 degrees by the year 2050. Uh, from our understanding, it's the first time internationally that there's been a piece of law that has explicitly named that IPCC number of 1.5 degrees of warming. Uh, so, because uh, we like to do things uh, first, <laughs> us as a little small country punching above our weight, a number um, of commentators and politicians find themselves being quite part of that. All of this work was spearheaded by the guy who was sitting next to me in that video that we played earlier. Uh, his name is James Shaw. He is the co-leader of the Greens in Aotearoa, New Zealand. We have a co-leadership model with both a male and a female leader. And uh, James worked across our parliament to get buy-in from every single political party. We recognise that as a smaller party, we are never going to be able to get anything done if other politicians and other political parties see it as giving us a win. We have to figure out a way to strategically make it a win for everybody. So that's exactly what James did, and we managed to get the vote of every 120 parliamentarians in Parliament except for one. Uh, and he happened to not be in the chamber at the time that the vote was taken, so his vote against wasn't actually recorded. So technically it was actually unanimous. Uh, just cautious of time, I'll run through quite quickly a few other things. The other major movements that we got across the line is something which has been talked about for uh, well over 20 years by the founder and co-leader of the Greens, Jeanette Fitzsimons. Uh, she's an incredible uh, lady who's still actively involved. She's now involved with Extinction Rebellion and regularly getting herself uh, changed to things uh, and standing very much on the front line for climate action. But Jeanette, about 20 years ago, identified that we have a massive problem with GDP as the measure of success for our country, um, our little country at the bottom of the world. And it's really fascinating if you look back at the history of GDP, that being gross domestic product, because in the 1930s, when the modern conception of it was first introduced to US Congress by a guy called Simon Kuznets, he said that this is a really great calculation to figure out how much a country is producing but God forbid, do not use it as a measure of the welfare or well-being of your country. And over the next 70 years, we accelerated into obviously rapid consumerism, hypercapitalism, uh, rampant individualism, and we did exactly that, uh, which is what its warner was, which is what its creator was warning against. So what we've done is taken some of those really green principles around a more holistic view of the economy, recognising that the economy very literally is just about the allocation of resources 
and sought to break it down to get a greater understanding of the allocation of those resources and the quality of them. So for example, one of the many flaws with GDP at present is that GDP goes up when there is an oil spill, when there is a natural disaster, when there is a car crash, when somebody gets cancer, all because there has to be economic transactions to undo that social ill. We're trying to unpack and understand those mobilizing variables that create that figure of GDP. And what we've begun to identify also with James uh, Shaw, who I mentioned earlier as the Green Co-Leader, he also happens to be the Minister of Statistics as well as the Minister of Climate Change, which we negotiated for when we were forming this government, which we found to be really critically important because whilst a boring title, it's all about the engine room and the variables and the things that a government counts. And what we've found is that what a government counts actually is what a government cares about and what a government sees matters. Uh, noting that I've just now hit my time, I just wanted to uh, raise the point that I'm now 25 years old and in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we're now going into our next election year in 2020 because we have an election every three years. Uh, I'm fortunate now to have reached a point in, I, I don't consider this a career at all, um, I often joke that the reason that I ended up in politics is because I was really bad at protesting, <laughs> uh, but I, I think it's really important for younger people in particular who are currently rallying outside of the system, who are being told and spoken down to that their opinion doesn't matter, because they don't have life experience, to remember and to question actually what people are talking about when they're talking about life experience. Because I know a number of older people who have spent the past 30 or 40 years of their life doing exactly the same thing day in and day out. And by noting that, I mean absolutely no disrespect, but what I do think is important is for us to recognise that experience is about exposure to novelty. It's not about sticking to your guns and doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. The very profound and unique life experience that younger people have to offer is hopefully an openness and a critical and creative mind. And that, I think, is the strength that younger people need to take up, recognising that, of course, they don't know everything, but the thing is, not a politician knows everything. And if they stand in front of you and tell you that they do, they're either lying or completely lacking self-awareness, and I'm not sure which is worse. So at the end of the day, um, if I can impart any message on you, it would be to get involved. Uh, and if you don't like your politicians, you have to remember that they are there either, either because the population elected them, certain people failed and neglected to elect others. So that's hopefully just a rallying cry to get involved. Kia ora, and thanks for having me.